Good afternoon everybody and welcome to the Scottish Parliament. I'll introduce myself, I'm Karen Adam MSP and I am part of the recently reconvened uh, cross-party group on care leavers. And I'd well, like to of course welcome you to the 2022 Festival of Politics. And this year's event celebrates the festival's 18th year of provoking, inspiring and informing people of all ages and from every walk of life to engage in three days of spirited debate. We're delighted that you'd be able to join us today to participate in the Care, Love and Understanding panel. And this is held in partnership with Who Cares Scotland. And later, I'll be inviting yourselves to get involved with any questions or comments that you have. And if you're keen to continue to throw your thoughts out there, you can do so by using the hashtag, hashtag uppercase F, lowercase O, uppercase P, 2022, Festival of Politics 2022. So I'm very pleased to be joined today by Nicola McCartney, Kenneth Murray, and Ryan McKeag. I pronounced that okay. McQuig. McQuig. That's right, not me. My first mistake. <laughs> okay. uh, Nicola McCartney is a Scottish based writer, director, and dramaturg, and talent behind the rehearsed reading Holding, Holding On, many of you have just seen. Kenneth Murray is a writer and campaigner with a passion for transforming public understanding of care experienced people. And Ryan McKeague is chair of the board at Who Cares Scotland and is a practicing lawyer. So there will be an opportunity for members of the audience to put questions and views to the panel throughout the event. So if I can start, um, I'd like to start by asking the panel some questions just to warm us up and get us going a little bit here. Can you define what do we mean when we talk about someone being care experienced? And who would like to answer? Who would like to kick off? You know, I think that's something that's shifted over the years and I think to give you an understanding of how real that shift is. So you are a part of the cross-party group on, on care leavers. That's a term that is becoming extinct in Scotland. It's a term that people are moving away from. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know, it becomes a kind of legal term. Care leaver is somebody who is looked after at the age of 16, uh, and they are entitled to lots of support. If you stop being looked after, like many people are at the age of 15 and a half, you're not entitled to you know, the 10 years of support that comes after that. So I think just to give you that real understanding of how shifting uh, those sands are, uh, how it's traditionally understood is somebody who is looked after either in foster care, in a local authority home, uh, secure care uh, by a relative, or is looked after at home with social support, or somebody who is adopted. That's great, thank you very much. Um, so to get a, a picture of what the care system looks like in Scotland in 2022, there, there is a list of damning statistics when it comes to care experienced people and the barriers to achieving a person's full potential from the disproportionate numbers, for example, in the prison service, which in 2019, 25% had been in care. And for individuals who are homeless, thought um, by practitioners to be between 30 to 50%, which is extraordinarily high. Um, would anybody like to come in and give their thoughts on that? Um. <laughs> I, as well as being all the things, though I do object to the word talent, but um, <laughs> all, 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 the, all the things that, that, that you were saying that, that I do, I, I was also a foster carer for Glasgow City Council between okay. 2006 and this year. And I've been trying to stop being a foster carer for quite some time. So I can only speak about my experience of working within that system. I can't mm. speak as a care experienced person these guys can, and other people in the room. But, and I've worked in prisons, and I've worked with homeless people, etc. and you're absolutely right that for me there is a common theme. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I think, um, given that we're a country that keeps kind of broadcasting itself to the nations as being really progressive, really different to the rest of the UK, um, our care system is fundamentally broken 
That's my experience of being inside it. What I watched the young people that I had a role in caring for go through was harrowing, heartbreaking, um, and most of the time really didn't work because they were not treated as people. And because I think that the care system, like one of the characters in the piece says, it doesn't exist really to care for young people in the system. And I was a carer. But that, those were not the instructions that I was ever really given in reality by any of the social workers that I worked with. And it made me very angry, and I still am. The care system is there to protect the adults within it. It isn't even about child protection. That's my experience of it. It's all about protecting the social workers. And for me, the foster carers, and there's some very good foster carers I have to speak up. You know, foster carers are in a really difficult position too. But our care system isn't, is not about care. And it's not about, certainly about looking after the people it's meant to be looking after. Um, and it's been like that for decades. Uh, and I would really like Scotland and our parliament to stop saying that it wants to kind of lead the world and start doing it, particularly for our most vulnerable people. What, what, what do you think would be the most important <coughs> part of that? What would be the first steps to action rather than just talking? For example, I've, I've spoken to a few friends um, who are care experienced and something that they would like to see is perhaps people who are care experienced it being a protected characteristic. I don't know, I'm going to, I'm going to pass that along, okay. but I think it starts before that. Okay. So I think it starts with us actually caring. I think it starts with um, the way that MSPs, politicians, civic leaders talk about care experienced mm. people to change the media. And I know we're going to touch on that to change mm. its representation of care experienced people. Mm. But fundamentally, it's about making the care system about care. And that is a complex thing, mm. but I would say protected characteristics is an icing thing and not a okay. deep systemic change that needs to happen. But then again, I pass on to people who know more than me. Uh, just on protected characteristic, um, that's a, not to be a lawyer, um, but that's a UK piece of legislation. So that would need the UK government um, to reopen the Equality Act. And um, I'm not sure that there is actually much appetite for that at the moment. What, what I think we can do here in Scotland is we can uh, change how we think about care. Um, as we've just seen so powerfully uh, demonstrated by the performance, which was fantastically written and amazingly delivered, by the way, I just wanted to say it's one of the uh, most accurate depictions of care experience uh, I've seen. Um, so thank you for that. But what we've seen from that is that social class and where you're born just defi so often defines where you end up in Scotland. Too often, if you think about the fact that there are 6% of the Scottish population go to private schools, yet 45%, according to a 2015 report, 45% of the top judges in Scotland are privately educated, yet are relying on uh, self-identification, 25% of the prison population are care experienced. So what we're seeing is that where you start off often uh, determines where you end up and the way that we can stop that is we can stop siloed thinking so one of the things that came out of the promise was that care experienced people often have to deal with one person for housing one person for their care one person for this one person for that yeah. because of siloed thinking now the scottish government recently uh, released a child poverty action plan mm -hmm. and a, the promise action plan to deliver the promise to reform the care system Thinking about those even as two separate issues potentially uh, makes us gloss over the obvious solutions, like families need more support. Yeah. We, we've seen here it's poor kids who, who get their uh, wains taken off them. Or, or I'm paraphrasing the, 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 the play, but, but that's so true. And actually, if we see this as an issue of poverty, first and foremost, and don't see poverty as neglect necessarily, mm -hmm. see that as a family that needs to be supported. If we, we change our thinking around that, we can get some quick wins, I think, in the care system. Do you know one of the, the interesting things about that poverty and, and where it comes from is uh, my pal Charlotte and I, we operated a book club in Pullman uh, with uh, care experienced men and uh, we went in on a sort of regular basis, read books, done critical analysis and one of the key contentions within Pullman, working in Pullman, which was a really sort of uh, confining environment, was 
that we would know people there. Uh, you know, people would identify Charlotte, they would identify me, or they would know where we were from, and you know, then that becomes the, you know, the line that uses others' intelligence on you. You know, security are interested in how you know this person and where they're from, because the fear is that then this person's going to use you to bring in drugs or to do, you know, yep. whatever sort of nefarious activities. And I think uh, it's that suspicion. And so some of the guys we met had been through secure care, had gone through children's homes, had been in foster care. Uh, and everywhere they went, they were met with suspicion, and here, here they were in prison. And I think, you know, when you live your life that way, it starts yeah. to define, it starts to become a self-fulfilling uh, narrative. Mm -hmm. yeah. But can I, can I just, it would have been a proper time just, as we discussed, just a link to Charlotte, who's in the front row, because <laughs> Charlotte has some, has some really interesting things. At the end of the film version of, of this piece, Charlotte gives a speech to camera, which she wrote herself which is largely addressing the questions that you are, that mm -hmm. question that you're asking us. So I just wondered if we could ask Charlotte what she <laughs> thinks. I'm very put on the spot there actually. I think, yeah, kind of echo what uh, Ryan and Kenny and the other words. Uh, I think for me there needs to be, if we want to have that cultural shift, we need to actually recognise as a country what we've done to hear experienced people. <laughs> yeah, we need to we need to look back and ac accept that we've had a role as the oppressor in these people's lives. And before before we can look at things like protected characteristic, there needs to be a recognition that we've caused a lot of pain and turmoil and trauma to a collective generation, like successive generations of people. And before we like, if we don't do that, we can never move forward. I, I look at other liberation campaign movements, I look at like the, the LGBT community and like some of the stuff that we're seeing now happening for the LGBT community is only happening because we're looking back at the past and recognising where us, not just the state, not just the state, it's really easy to blame the government and say it's just the government, but all of us as individuals have had a role in oppressing care experienced people throughout history mm -hmm. and I think to move forward as a government, as a, as a country, we really need to to take that recognition individually in ourselves, because even myself as a care experience person, I have a role to play in that. And like, I talk about, you know, I was Lisa in the, in the play. I talked about intergenerational cycles of um, care, but those are so interlinked in intergenerational cycles of poverty. It doesn't take you like very far back in my family cycle to see where poverty has affected our family, like right the way through probably the very beginning of our family. I think those things are so closely linked um, I guess what I'm saying to sort of sum it up is that we need to look back in order to, to move forward and so far we've not been doing an awful lot of looking back in my opinion. Mm -hmm. There's not an awful a lot of recognition like part of my um, provocation at the end of the, the full film which I highly encourage everyone to go and watch <laughs> is um, talking about the fact that in like 100 years realistically not an awful lot has changed in the care system. There's been a hell of a lot of legislation. There's been a hell of a lot of like well-intentioned policy, but when you really think about the, the experience of people and what like people went through 100 years ago, it's not massively different to what I experienced when I was in care. And that, I think that's damning, actually, that I could experience something that I, a Victorian offer would have experienced. Like, have we really moved forward? My like honest opinion is I don't think we have. And, you know, we're, we're placing an awful lot of emphasis on this promise, but we're promising pretty much nothing if we don't actually look back at where we came from. There you go. Thank you. I, I th you know, I, I really um, appreciate what you said there, Charlotte, and I think it's a whole societal shift and outlook that we have to, that we need and also, it, it does sit with that equalities and that internal biases that people have. And it's in our language and it's just in how we act and how we treat people who come forward to talk to us and how we even listen you know, to those stories. And um, I think that's an incredibly uh, poignant point. Thank you. So, I mean, moving into that, up, up, linking into that, how does society treat and view young people and adults who are care experienced. Um, you know, we can think about the prejudice that some people have in regards to Orphan Annie or, you know, Harry Potter uh, and things like that. And um, I'm wondering if, if anybody would like to come in on that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, 
I went to this uh, interesting uh, exhibit at the Foundling Museum in London, uh, which is like, a really neat move by a charity to reconstruct their image. Uh, but one of the things that they had in there was uh, the very first uh, issue of Annie as a comic in the Chicago Tribune. Uh, and the story centres around uh, young kids from the, the neighbourhood in Chicago wanting to come and see what orphans look like. Uh, and, and Annie sort of challenging them on their prejudice, and I think that was in like 1901 or something. And I don't know that much has changed. You know, I think there's this kind of uh, we talk about you know poverty safaris and, and things yeah. like that. And you know, whenever we ha have events with Kate experience people, there are so many well well attentioned folk that want to come along and, and be seen. And you know, that's seen in its most gross form in America, where you know they do fun fairs and you can come along and meet some of them. Yeah. Uh, and I think the the media has a huge part to play in that. You know, there's this narrative of a uh, superhero to psychopath and some of the best selling movies and books and TV, sh like most viewed TV Marvel. shows, yet Marvel, you yeah. know, <laughs> uh, you like on Netflix, which, you know, people are like, oh, I can't wait to watch it, you know, sit down with like a, like a, a bar of chocolate and like a, a wee coffee. And it's actually a guy who grew up in foster care was abused. And, you know, because of that, he wants to murder and rape people. And I think like, it's just, a straight line, you know, I think yeah. there's an element of lazy writing, I think there's an element of sort of really embedded prejudice that's gone on for hundreds of years and this is what we're being fed, you know, and mm. there's there's a play on in the fringe just now and they advertise it as we spoke to, to some Kate experience people come along and see it and they do a little bit of like chat and stuff uh, and it, it, it's so interesting because that's like a selling point, people come along and see it because of that, but nobody at all in the production or around it is Kate experienced. Uh, yeah. And I think, you know, it's because of that there's something missing, you know, something different Absolutely. to this performance. And I think for me, until care experience people start to define that narrative, we're, we're going to start seeing uh, that this going on for even longer. Mm -hmm. uh, just to pick up on that, I, I think as, as Nicola was saying, in Scotland we are very forward about saying how progressive we are as a country. Now we are relatively progressive, certainly in the, in the UK. Um, we have a left to centre government and we have a government who have committed to reforming the care system because it's the right thing to do, right? But to, in order to uh, create that change across society, uh, going back to the question, we, we, we really need to examine how, how progressive are we really when uh, there is a proposal to put a children's unit into a nice area in, uh, somewhere in Scotland? What, what, are the, what are the responses to that planning permission proposal mostly going to be? That's where we see actually what type of country we are when it comes to how we view care experienced people coming into our communities and mixing with our children and all the types of phrases that you see uh, in newspaper reports and on these planning portals. And I think that's why it's so important that we uh, educate people from as early as possible. And one of the projects that we've done at Who Cares Scotland that I'm really proud of is Communities That Care. So we had uh, volunteers in schools and in communities in Renfrewshire uh, right across and what we've seen is a marked change in attitudes towards care experienced people. We saw the community start to own care experienced people and we were teaching people as young as primary school age about care and why people go into care, why it's not their fault and why uh, they are an asset to their community. And if we can get projects like that right across Scotland, we can change attitudes across generations and hopefully then we will actually be as progressive as we think we are. So one of the things through doing this project that became even more clear for me was this whole care market thing and how utterly broken that is. Mm. Um, because I was working with one particular individual who works within a private care organisation and you only saw a bit of what she told me. It's appalling. And also two people working in a local authority to sort of repatriate young people who've been sent out with that local authority to private care firms um, who are ripping us off. They're ripping us off. They're ripping off the Scottish taxpayer. But most of all, they're destroying the lives of those children who we're placing there. And, and I would like to see a root and branch review of the private care sector market in Scotland, specifically for children and young people, because it's utterly appalling. These children's lives are being their potential is being wasted and their lives are being destroyed and these people as the character Ailey says the directors of these companies are, are drawing in huge profits yeah. we can't let that continue can't let yeah. that continue
actually oh, really interesting report that came out in 2000 and, uh, earlier this year. The Competitions and Markets Authority did it. I'm just I was thinking about this there. So I really recommend if you're interested to learn more about it. It's called the Children's Social Care Market Study, and there's a breakdown for the entire like market of children's social care in Scotland. I can send it to you guys. It's like yeah, yeah, thanks, Charlotte. Really, really, really it. interesting. Like, complete breakdown of what the market looks like on children's social care, and there's an entire part. It actually looks at the whole UK, but mm. it, it highlights every single problem with the children's market, and that was like by the Competitions and Market Authority. So, like, it's there laid out for us already. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's always the issue if we, we mix any kind of profits with care, whether that's, you know, within the health system, the, the elderly care system, you know, and, and children's care, young, children and young people's care, it's, um, that does not mix. I don't yeah. think it ever yeah. does mix. And, um, Can I come back on the point as well? I think what, um, I didn't catch your name, but I think what she really interest, uh, illustrated was like, the need to sort of end this idea that when you leave care, that suddenly like you're off that cliff edge and that's where the, the, mm, yeah. the support stops. Because like I, I said it in a piece, like being in care was something that happened to me, but it's something that I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. Like I often reflect on the impact that's going to have on me as a parent, like where that's going to take me mm. right away through my life. And if you're going to speak about key experience, it is an experience that is lifelong. Like it mm. doesn't just suddenly, okay, I've left care at 16 and that's me, that's me completely finished with that experience in my life. Like the way that um, the lady was explaining that the impact that's having on our sons right away through every yeah. single person that's been in care feels that right up until yeah. the day they die. Like the, the experiences that we go through are with us every single stage of our life and like they present themselves completely differently at every single stage of our life. So mm -hmm. there needs to be a real focus, like something that I, Praise highly the Scottish government for is the removal of the upper age limit for the key experience yeah. bursary. Like, mm -hmm. That's a really good piece of work that has enabled people to, to go to university. I'm, I'm directly benefiting of that myself right now. I think more work like that, more okay. recognition, stop putting age limits on the support that we're giving to key experience people because our experiences don't just suddenly expire when mm -hmm. we turn 26. That's not the way it works, unfortunately. I mean, it would be great if it did, suddenly I would cure it. <laughs> 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 I, I would have to spend so much money on therapy, but do you know what I mean? <laughs> it doesn't work like that. No, absolutely. And, um, you know, I have constituents who have came to me and, um, you know, I don't want them to be identifiable, but there has been, as I'll watch, you know, generalise this, but there has been issues with them now as grown adults and services that they um, are looking to support for, you know, just, just for everyday general things. And there seems to be a bias there and they're wondering why life is harder for them than other people. There seems to be a bit more gatekeeping, a bit more yeah, suspicion. I, mean, like, I did a lot of work with KHB Experience when I worked for Maker Scotland. So, shock, I worked for Maker Scotland. But uh, <laughs> I did a report and I was speaking to some young parents and even like in, in the maternity booking in, yeah. like, there's a list mm. of questions and it's like, have you ever been I'm a sex worker, have you ever been in prison? Have you ever did recreational drugs? Oh, and by the way, have you ever been in care? Mm. Both of them are all in the same like yeah. package of yeah. and it doesn't matter if you left care. Absolutely. It's like I have a baby at 33 and have to declare the fact that I was in care and be no risk at all. I could be seen as a success. But as soon as that goes on, it's flagged up to social work mm -hmm. immediately. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And I think, I think you, you know, in terms of that support and I think, you know, when you think about what the government can do, you know, there's so many things. So, you know, we had the National Confidential Forum. We've got a Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry that's ongoing. We had the Independent Care Review, which has become the Promise, and you have the Promise uh, Collective. You have the, the, the Promise Oversight Board. You have, you know, all of the different co-chairs who are all like, sort of doing things. And there's lots of interested people. And there's lots of support. But you know, things like Redress Scotland, for example, you know, there are very tight limits on how you can access that support, who gets that support, who that extends to. And I think. When we think about the support we offer to care experienced people, we try and think about it in boxes. In that way, that in the piece to talk about, you know, emotions being in boxes, and I think it's easy to sort of start to categorise things because it means you can, at the end of the day, go, you know, I think I've done something, I've ticked that box, we've moved on, we've given that support. And I think, you know, we need to start taking a whole family, a whole life approach mm -hmm. to, to some of this stuff. Absolutely. A, a whole, a holistic, yeah. as I say, approach, yeah. Um, moving on from that, and I suppose that, you know, this is linking into it as well, though. What roles do class and poverty play in the care system? 
yeah, not to repeat myself, but I think it's a massive indicator is your likelihood to end up the care system. I grew up in Easter House, um, then, probably still now, was regularly labelled one of the most deprived areas in Europe. Um, when I was in care, I was moved into Parkhead, lived in Br Bridgeton. Apologies to anybody who's actually from these areas, we know they're actually called Easter House, Parkhead and Brigton, but I'm just... <laughs> I'm just translating it for the Edinburgh people uh, through here. <laughs> So, um, yeah, but, but the, all of those areas where I lived, right, high concentration of poverty, high concentration of addiction, high concentration of care experience, intergenerational poverty, intergenerational childhood trauma, that's the reason I ended up in care, you know. I, when I read uh, my care records, it's full of threats towards my mum to address her addiction or I'll be taken away. There's no really that support to yeah. try and actually alleviate her problems which were coming out of poverty. And you just need to, to see the stark contrast in, in uh, attitudes towards this. If you go to any bookshop, any card shop, any supermarket, and you'll see a card that says why mommy wants to drink wine, or making some kind of joke about using alcohol as a, as a dependency or a, as a, a coping mechanism. When it's like uh, on a class, uh, on a card, and it's like a kind of middle class joke, it's like, oh yeah, why mommy drinks wine? When that happens in a scheme, it's like, let's take your kids off you. So I, I think that actually we need to uh, recognise how much of an impact class is, not just in how we see yeah. care, but alcohol, addiction, everything. I think, um, like, that's such a remnant of like Thatcherism, though. If you think about like where we were in the 80s and the impact that had on schools and schools in Scotland, you see like the way that Scotland's housing policy was completely different, like the way that that's so closely interlinked. I would love to see a study on the way that Thatcherism had an impact on Scotland and the link that, you think about like diseases of despair, we think about people that are getting their kids taken off of them because they have addictions and like this so interlinked, it's unbelievable. There needs to be a huge piece of work to go back, again, I keep talking about going back, but like yeah. the way that like even in the 50s and 60s after the war, the way that housing was completely different in the schemes of Glasgow than it was like to, uh, comparable cities like Manchester or Liverpool, we see like high, um, death rates in the, the population of care community people, like, that, this is all so closely linked, like, it's the way that policy has been enacted in Scotland in a completely different sense mm -hmm. that has across the UK, and, like, we wonder why, like, for example, um, why we're having a, a drugs crisis in Scotland just now, There's, those are very interlinked mm -hmm. with the crisis that we're experiencing with care community people just now, like, mm -hmm. they're all conversations that are happening in different sections yeah. of the government, but mm -hmm. they all need to be happening in one place, like, and all at the root of that, the cause of all of that, is poverty. Like these mm -hmm. are things that connect every single one of these high level issues that we're experiencing in Scotland right now is poverty. That's yeah. the thing that connects them all. That's why I set James's story beside Alex's story, that section about poor, poor people's kids mm -hmm. that exists in the performance with um, James who grew up in a scheme in North Glasgow in the, the 50s and 60s and Alex who's grown up in a scheme in North Glasgow in the 90s mm. and very little about their living conditions and their poverty having changed but everything about societal fracture and community being mm -hmm. changed which I would say directly links to Thatcherism of course <laughs> and what kind of you know there is no such thing as society and the breakdown mm. but I think James makes a really good point there that community still exists it's yes. just that absolutely everything in, mm -hmm. in our culture is stacked against it. Mm -hmm. So actually, one of the things that, that for me, I try, I try to do is be community wherever mm -hmm. I am because mm -hmm. we have to be resistant. I think being community for each other is yes. like one of the strongest, mm -hmm. strongest ways that we can resist mm -hmm. kind of all of these kind of nefarious forces that are, yeah. that are working on us right now, but especially like understanding that care experience people are our community yeah. <laughs> they're they're part of us we're part Absolutely. of them we're we're kind of you know we're, we're interlinked to yeah. each other i think um that's you know such an important point an aspect of that because we know that connection is incredibly important to human beings whether mm. that's place or with people and connecting with identity and um, it, it could even be, you know, hobbies and passions mm. and disconnection, the opposite to that is, is the, the ill of many um, problems in mm. society. I've seen that, 
to the extreme scale in this country. We literally put kids on boats and sent them to Australia, to Canada, to Rwanda. Mm. How many people in this room knew that? Like, pretty much probably no one, I would think so. That's a huge part of our history. We, we literally took children's kids off of them, put them on boats, and then sent them across the world because mm. we didn't want to place them in the UK. Like, that's absolutely insane. Disgusting. And I think that, you know, community and identity and so if I, if I try and think about my, my childhood homes and I, like where I lived, uh, the only ones that are still standing are the ones that belong to the foster carers. Like all, all of the, the homes that, that I grew up in and housing schemes are knocked down for like regenerated housing. And they, they take the people from those homes and they spread them out across the schemes into different schemes, you know, they can label them. You know, people from Easter House being moved to Govan and, and just sort of totally disconnecting them from, from their communities. And, mm -hmm. and exactly the same as happened in the 50s yeah. and 60s, as James is saying, when he got moved mm -hmm. from a poor community in yeah. city centre to a North Glasgow housing and, scheme. And yeah. sort of 50, 40, yeah. 50 years later, it's, it's, it's the same So we seem again. to be doing the same things over and over again. Mm -hmm. And it all seems to centre around how we're dealing with poverty that then has all these horrific consequences yeah. for our health service, our prisons, and our care Absolutely, system. Yeah. And those are all people. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we haven't planted all <laughs> to find maybe a four or five bedroom house. Now, I'm not saying the foster carers didn't need that, they did need that to provide the accommodation for the children, but actually the family needed that to begin with. They needed yeah. help to move out that area. Yeah. And I always had a kind of a problem with that because I could see the care the children were getting, but I knew what support the family needed. And that's something that comes back to class and poverty. And yeah. where we see, um, how we invest in people and the value in people mm -hmm. and who was to say that the foster carers were worth more investment than the, the children's parents mm -hmm. and the children themselves. I have to say as a recent until recently foster care that that's really changed and nobody ever gave me money to have a four or five bedroom <laughs> house. <laughs> I have a, a two bedroom flat in Mary Hill so um, but uh, with foster carers, a lot of that's changed too. Like that's why foster placements are so unstable in lots of ways. There's very little will to hold placements together when they're when they're working, and often the evidence of a placement kind of like um, working is is when it becomes like the, the young person is just behaving like a young person. Like mm -hmm. you, you asked about um, attitudes. The entire care system is riddled with this. Um, how would you put it? It's like pathologization of young people okay. in care. Yeah. So everything they do becomes about, well, it's cause they're in care. They're yeah. just being a teenager. They're just yeah. being a child, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, but actually there, there isn't the will often, you know, to, I, I went through one heartbreaking placement that changed my life where it was ripped to pieces by a system which could not see mm -hmm. that like we, that young person just needed to be held mm -hmm. <laughs> longer and looked after and treated just like a, teen, a 16 year old teenager who was mm -hmm. having a really hard time, yeah. not like some specimen yeah. Yeah. that had to be removed to a dustbin somewhere else because yes. they weren't working, yeah. you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, I can literally speak to that about my own records. Like there's times throughout my records that I'm called subject and not even called <gasps> my name. Like people talking about me in my case, how like subject was found on the street drunk. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that happen to other young people. What I ended up doing was as a respite care, supporting placements that were breaking down mm -hmm. because I'd been through one that was pretty, pretty hardcore. And, um, and again, it will, again, not the young person, everything else. And actually what's really interesting about the Scottish government extending to 25 is that often foster carers are discouraged from keeping young people in their homes until they're 25 because there's, we need beds and also the money changes mm -hmm. and it's not a lot of money anyway. Like I'm still, who got a four or five bedroom house? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, 
I, I ended up subsidising like our living costs out of my own pocket, it, not not from what I was getting from Glasgow City Council all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's foster care are not actually paid like ridiculous sums unless they're packing them in, mm. which shouldn't be happening anyway. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's not a great gig being a foster carer, really. And that's if if you can't support the carers, and it's true of social workers as well. If the system can't support the people who are looking after the people, mm -hmm. then how how does anything work? Do you know the, the love needs to be primarily for those young people? But we all have to be treating each other with love and respect, yeah. or nothing works. Absolutely, it's a domino system. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, that, that leads on really, really nicely, actually, to, to my next question is, where do unconditional love, compassion and support all figure in the care system? And can you actually embed these vital qualities in a system? I think that scene with Ailey and Cathy shows that. So those two workers towards the end, who, neither of whom are social workers, one is an educationalist and one is a projects manager. Um, they are trying, they are doing love within a system, re bringing back young people who are out with a local authority to where they live and where they, people talk the same language and where their families are, rather than just discarding them and throwing them away somewhere else into the private sector. They're bringing them back to where they live, where they were born and the local culture that they know. And they're giving them an education that fits around them and addressing their needs holistically um, Kathy says something really interesting. We have to hold the young people in the care system as if they were our own child. And, you know, that's what I thought my job was as a foster care. You know they're not your own children. They yeah. never will be, nor should they be. But yeah. you have to treat those young people like that. And actually, if they can do it within that local authority, they can be doing it in local authorities throughout Scotland. Absolutely. And I think um, what you're saying there, and I really wish I could remember, if I remember this, I'll, I'll put it out on my socials, <clears throat> but there was a quote by somebody who said that, you know, unconditional love is more than the love you would show your child, it's the love you would show yourself yeah. as a child. Mm -hmm. It's the person that you needed as a child. That's who you yeah. become and that's the love that, that you project. And do you know what that, that do you know what that love is? It's in people. And I think mm. so that's where where the love is. But I think what we do is we introduce barriers to that. You you know, so there's shift patterns in children's homes. Or, you know, you're a short term foster care or you're a long term foster care. No, you're this, you're that, you know. Actually the money's going to be this, now it's going to be that. Mm. Uh, and I think we are the ones that introduce the barriers to that love. Uh, because the love isn't people, you know, nobody becomes a foster carer because they, they don't want to love a child. Nobody yeah. becomes a social worker yeah. because they don't want to create an environment where children can be loved. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it, but it's also people that create the barriers. And I think, you know, there's this kind of dissonance that, that exists within us that we need to address before mm -hmm. we can move forward. I think that's, that's possibly maybe like red tape, whereas you wouldn't see red tape in, you know, in, in, a, fo in a home, mm. but you see red tape Mm. In, a, in, in a system that's supposed to, so it's trying to, you know, reflect and mirror our home, but it, 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 think, you know, it does, doesn't. I got my, my, my medical records uh, just recently, and I've been going through them, and I, I, I really vividly remember lying on a doctor's bed, uh, and they, where they were making a note and a figure to show that I'd got my first pub. And, <laughs> and, and for me, it was this really in-depth kind of, like, analysis of my health and they're, you know, they're looking after me, they wanted to make sure I was fine, so you know, yeah, he's got pubes, we'll put that down. And I could go back to school and be like, I've even got a form that says I've got pubes. <laughs> uh, and, but for me, it's like, it's that, it's that different way we treat people, right? Because like, yeah. like, nobody's mum's like, oh, here's a card, you've got your first pub, well done. Well, like, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but I think for me, there's just, it's in those wee details that we see the difference, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, the, the sort of like, uh, the red tape and, and, you know, the way that we keep records and, yeah. and things like that. You know, we, yeah. we treat people like, like specimens. And for me, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the thing that needs to change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you. I'm just going to check in with the time. Am I okay? What time is it? Two o'clock. Oh, okay. Oh no, I'm really enjoying the conversation and going a bit over. Um, so, I suppose for the next ten minutes, we could open the floor to to any questions or comments that people may have. If you put your hand up the and just keep it up, the mic will come to you. If you've got something, there's somebody. Yeah. 
Hi, I've um, been like, really excited to see this event. I think any piece of verbatim theatre that has the people whose stories are represented there present, and any piece of verbatim theatre that provokes a discussion like this is really doing its job. So congratulations to NTS, Nicola, and the whole team. My question is simply, given that it's capable of, um, that all you guys are here whose stories this involves, and that it's raising these questions, will the show have a life beyond this? Can we take this, because it really kicks the door, it demands that the questions are asked, and it's very moving. Mm -hmm. So it creates an environment, I think, which should lead towards the important discussions carrying on. So will there be a life for the show after this? You know, uh, I, I think there should be. Uh, and I'm, go, I'm, I'm, going to do the, I'm going to do the bone of the horn for it because, you know, I, I'm, real, I'm really interested in media portrayal of, of care experienced people and it's so difficult to find something that's good. And I think, you know, the, o the only other thing that I've seen that, that's been any good in sort of the last 10 years was, it was a show called How Not To Drown that, that Nicola was involved in. Again, there's a common denominator, people who believe <laughs> in people and, and putting power at the centre. And I think, you know, again, that, that's somebody's voice who, who's in it. And I think, you know, we need to, to open their arms to, to feel like this, that, that gets into communities, that gets into people's hearts, rather than, you know, uh, treating it like, like an experiment. And I, I think for me that that's, that is the next step. And, you know, I, d I don't know what's going on, like with like the NTS and their projects and all that sort of stuff, but that, that's just my opinion as somebody that was, mm -hmm. was around it. I mean, I think, uh, I don't know. So we can all, I can also say I don't know. There was never, th this was a pilot project. Mm -hmm. That, and I think some of the funders of the project are here today, the original project, and there was another part to this project as well, made by the company 21 Common with learning uh, disabled adults, a really amazing film um, that was fantastic. Um, so uh, we really don't know. I mean, I think, I think what's really interesting though about a national theatre company like NTS even being interested in doing something like this mm. is, is about trying to start a national conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, there is a really strong learning and engagement team that has a history of going into local communities and doing projects like this. Mm -hmm. So, but the money has to be there. Mm -hmm. So like every, everything else, there has to be like funding for it. And we just, we just don't know at the moment. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I will keep advocating in all of the work that I do mm -hmm. kind of for um, the communities that I engage with. Um, and I think that's all we can do. What, like when you're an artist, all you can really do is start conversations, yeah. you know? And, and when you're an art, artistic company, to me, that's all the point of art. Start mm -hmm. conversations about anything and everything, mm -hmm. because that's unfortunately what's crippling these islands at the minute, is we don't have conversations. We just shout at each other. <laughs> and so I think that, I, you know, I, I, yeah, it would be great if, if this project went further, either, either with NTS or, or someone else. But for me, the most important thing is that right at the heart of this are the voices of people in the system. Absolutely. And, uh, and it was the same with How Not to Drown. It's about like centering those people's mm -hmm. voice, not mine, mm -hmm. you know? <coughs> Though my rage is in it. <laughs> <laughs> is there anyone else with their hand up? I should have put, oh, here we go. Sorry. I should have put my specs on. <laughs> wonderful and thank you very much and there's so many points that I would want to pick up and obviously can't with time um, in terms of systems and changing them and how we change them I think it has to be what we're talking about here changing the narrative educating people getting the conversation happening at a group a group a, a, sorry a root level and valuing the people who are experts by experience having their voice heard and shouted loud and I think the conversation needs to expand slightly broader than poverty and, and the other things we've talked about today. And we need to look at trauma across the board. Yeah, yeah. And thankfully, trauma is on the, you know, it's on the agenda. It's front and centre. It needs to be even more so. But part of what the vision is for Trauma Informed Scotland is to recognise the importance of the, the expert on the ground and for us all to unify systems and simplify things and stop hiding behind the title that is the system and bringing it back to a person. else that would like to come in? Um, so my two wee points was, like, there's two points, and then I've got a question for you guys. Um, so 
that like, you were talking about like barriers and things um, like in my personal experience recently um, we, uh, well I c in, can't find the words <laughs> um, like I came across like a situation in like my own story well not my story but like things that I'm going through the now and like basically um, there was an assumption made by my social, well, one of my social workers who said, just because you're in education, we expect you to do X, Y, and Z, which I basically fired that one back to her and was like, not everybody, regardless of their educational status, can make big decisions like moving flat or whatever by themselves. We need mm -hmm. that. Um, support and assistance yeah. um, and the other point was basically like in my own journey in foster care like one of the main barriers was that my foster carer never understood what was going on for me like um, like me and my older sister were placed together um, and my older brother was separated but like they didn't understand that like obviously going through the process of losing her dad and like the stress and trauma that that brung as well. Mm. Like nobody understood us why we were acting out, like behaving the way that we were behaving. And then that then resulted in both of us, like me and my older sister being separated. Um, and my question for you is, was like, if you can change one thing within the care system, that's including you, Karen. Um, <laughs> if you can change, like, help to change one thing in the care system just now, <coughs> big or small, what would it be? <laughs> so that the people who, the people who have experienced the system, whether you've been a young person or a child within the system, or whether you've been a carer within the system that you're listened to, mm. that your voices are heard, but especially if you're a care experienced person, that you are heard mm -hmm. and that your experience is given honor, is like respected and given honor. Mm. Um, I yeah. think that is the most yeah. significant thing that will change everything from the Absolutely. hearings system to the care system itself. It's, it's a very difficult question uh, to answer. Thank I think what I would do, if I could change one thing is, I think, and, and it picks up on both of the situations that you just described there, I think what we really need to focus on is putting relationships at the heart of everything yeah. we do. And that sounds slightly glib when you say that, but ultimately if you start with relationships, that, that you can't go far wrong in, in terms of, if somebody is moving house and they have a traditional two-parent household, they will not be expected to do that on their own. Yeah. They will be given support, emotional, probably financial. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we can provide those relationships, whether that's through foster care or throughout the care system as a, as a whole, that, that's, that's where we, we really have to start from. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not just, let's do this because it's the right thing to do. Let's do this because it will improve outcomes for one of the most... Uh, underrepresented communities in Scotland. Actually, what the promise shows is that even if you take an economically conservative view of the care system, even if you're on the right fiscally, it doesn't even make sense financially the way we do it. It doesn't make sense on any level. The follow, follow the money report <coughs> shows that we're actually wasting money. And if we just done things right, supported people properly, gave them relationships and stopped them from living in poverty, which by the way, if you believe any commentator is going to get a lot worse in the next five years, um, if we actually just done that and started from that place, we'd, we'd, we'd make a whole lot of ground. And, the, and just the second thing, I'm going to cheat and say I would, I would change two things. Uh, support, support has to be lifelong for care experienced people. It doesn't, you, you don't lose your care experience at 26, you don't lose your care experience at 56. And you should have access to independent advocacy or whatever type of support that you need throughout your entire life. Do you know, I think for me, the one thing is so if you go home today and you Google Tier 4 Sturgeon announces care review and it's the First Minister announcing the independent root and branch review of the care system and one of the things she says in it is 
we need to start uh, making things happen for young people in care, you know, and for care experienced people, and not just stop think ha think, not just stop things happening to them. And I think for me that that's the thing that I would change. I would start making things happen for care experienced people, whether that's educational support, financial support, you know, supporting their livelihood, supporting rebuilding relationships with brothers and sisters they've been separated from. I think that that's the one thing I would I would change. I think. Um you know, from my point of view, who, from somebody who hasn't had lived experience, lived experience is exceptionally important. And I've seen the power of words since I've been elected. I've seen the power that people can have sitting at the decision-making tables. And I've been able to, to shift narratives of conversation and pull things in a certain direction because I lived experience that I've had. Because when you talk from the heart, it means a lot more. It moves more people. You get more people on board and they listen. I would like to see more people with lived experience getting involved in politics, being at the decision-making tables, and actually having a direct say in how things are run. I also look at what we're doing with the Social Security Scotland at the moment and all the work going into that and the difference between that and the DWP. Now the systems to get the disability payments, it's the same ranking, it's the same you know, system that's used, but the people have been trained to be compassionate, to be kind. Um, people are treated with respect and not suspicion. Now if we can roll that out into these systems, why can't we do this in the care system? And the other thing is, I, I just, the word system is quite irritating because it's, it makes you think ultimately of a path that has already been forged for you. It's a system of you know, paths and connections that's there that can't be broken out of. So I think that holistic and, and in particular an intuitive approach is um, much more important when, when we're looking at, at these you know, areas and, and making decisions. Um, but more importantly, from myself, the biggest change we can make to the care system is, is definitely you can start by lobbying all your um, politicians and make a big racket about it. And be seen. Representation is, is extremely important. Um, so we're running out of time there, but I, I want to thank you all for your contributions. It's, it's just been uh, fantastic. I want to thank the panel, Nicola, Kenneth and Ryan and I just want to take the opportunity to remind you that there may be um, more festival events taking place today. There's an in conversation with the poet and writer Lem Sisse, have I said that right, who will be talking about his own experience of the care system and his best selling memoir My Name Is Why and that's at 6.30 today. Um, you also have time to take part in the panel. Do you trust politicians? <laughs> ah! <laughs> I'm so glad my children aren't here for that. And that's at four o'clock. And the State of the UK Union at six. I might go to that one. I do hope <laughs> you'll be able to join us. But what I would like to do before uh, we completely finish up is just to, I don't want to be the closing words on this. I'd like to ask Charlotte if there's any final words you'd like to say to everybody. <laughs> and she's got a bag on ready to go. <laughs> she, I saw her getting her t ties laces. Uh, you know, the biggest thing I really want to see going forward now is, I, I don't know if anyone has guessed it yet, but I'm a, history, a history student and I really care about history. And I want some formal recognition of the history of care experience people to take place. Like One of the proudest things that I've ever done in my life was create um, national... That's not a lie, you don't want national... Care Experience History Month. I really want to see the government supporting that. I want recognition of the immense history that key experienced people have. Mm -hmm. like there needs to be, a, a, I don't know, a month that I've created, but there needs mm -hmm. to be some, some more support behind that because our history is so like colourful. There's so much to learn. Mm -hmm. there's, there's real moments of joy and there's real moments of sadness that I think people would just benefit from, from knowing like, my life is transformed from knowing the history of my like everybody wants to know where they come from yeah. and at the, at the yeah. moment care experienced people just don't know and our own individual life histories we don't know where we come from but as a community of people there's not enough conversation about it so I think the biggest thing for me is I 
want to see that recognition like at the highest levels of government but all the way out mm-hmm. through communities as well because like we've been through like we've been there in society since society started mm-hmm. and we've had massive contributions to that like before and there's been no recognition of that for our family there. so mm-hmm. yeah that's the biggest thing that i want to see happen thank you and thank you everybody thank, thank you, you.